Thank you for letting me preach. You're welcome. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Love the pressure. <laughs> um, we've already had like a sermon over there, really good one, and a sermon over there, and we sang sermons, and so, hey. <laughs> okay, I'll still talk. <laughs> I wanted to start, um, I, I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what do we need to hear? What do I need to hear? Um, I've been a Christian for 53 years. <laughs> anyway. You win. I know. <laughs> so, Easter, we've been through a lot of Easter's, you know. But uh, we're, not done, we're not done growing. We're not done learning. We're not done growing. We're not done getting to know who he is and, and who we are in relation to him. And so I guess we're going to do Easter one more time. I want to start by reading, and I was going to have you all read, but I'm just going to read the Apostles' Creed, because it's impressive to me. Um, this one is the very first one that I could find on the internet, and it was written in 140 AD. And so that's like not very long after Christ has died and risen, and the early church wrote down the critical foundational beliefs of Christianity. And it was kind of good for me to, to hear this. So I say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born by the Virgin of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence we shall, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy, I call it universal church, because you always have to explain that. And in universal church, the communion of saints, uh, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and uh, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. People have recited this or the other ones that were revised a little bit later, like 3, 340, 380s, they rewrote stuff. But it's basically the same. They recited it as they were getting baptized into Christ, into Christianity. And this is what they're supposed to, supposed to believe. And um, as I was thinking about that, I think, yeah, I, I believe all that stuff. But um, there's more to Christianity than just some facts. Uh, more than just believing this, uh, this statement and then going out and living your life. And so I just want to talk a little bit about that because I, I think that... Uh, when Jesus was crucified, it was huge for his disciples. Uh, they had been following him and learning from him. And, uh, and then it wasn't supposed to go that way in their minds, where Jesus would be captured, misjudged, and then crucified on a cross. And I, I have a hard time uh, thinking about how that must have felt for them, what they, what they must have thought. And so... Um, I wanted to uh, go through just a little bit about the, uh, the that first morning when when Jesus you know rose from the dead. Um, they knew Jesus as just as just as just a, a, a man. It says in Isaiah 53 that he wasn't he wasn't anything special or unusual as far as a man. He looked like a man, and uh, he didn't have a halo. He wasn't walking around like some of the pictures. Um, so he's, he's a man, but he starts to do some things as he starts his ministry. Um, he, he would honestly and genuinely listen to people who were talking. And he, would, he cared, and he had the ability to, to see past the surface discussion if they were doing that and go right to their heart and talk to them. And that's kind of special. But I have seen that in people. I, I have people in my past that were like that. And so Jesus was, he looked normal, but he, he was, you know, incredible in that ability to listen and care. But so far, I've seen that before. And then uh, he did do some miracles. I haven't seen too much of that. I mean, not done by a person. Um, he healed people. He fed people. He forgave sins. Um, okay, one other thing he did was he raised, you know, his friend Lazarus from the dead. <laughs> That's a little unusual. <laughs> and so that his followers, you know, they, they see him, normal guy, really caring. Uh, 
does these miracles and then raises Lazarus from the dead. And also a young girl, you know, raises her from the dead. So now it's starting to be, this isn't just an average normal person. This guy is, is, is special. And he, uh, he taught some things um, that, that were kind of hard to, to believe. He taught that, that everybody out here was, um, had turned away from God. And uh, were actually uh, enemies of God. And that everybody needs to be saved. Needs to be rescued not from evil or from sin, but almost rescued from ourselves. Because we're so selfish. We're just that way. And, and he showed us that. And then he said, you, you need to be saved. He also taught he's the only way, the truth and the life. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> This is getting out of hand. Um, so, so this is the man that, that, they, uh, that they saw and that they walked with and that they loved, really, and that they waited for him to bring the kingdom. Um, but but what, what happened in their hearts and in their minds when that person was hung on the cross? What? Wait. All their expectations kind of burned up. Um, we're going to go to John 20, verse 9. Uh, this is at the, at the tomb, the first morning. And uh, there's a bunch, and you could, you could talk about this forever. There's so much about the resurrection in here. But um, for, as, as people are coming and seeing and going away, stuff like that, there's a verse in here that's kind of interesting. Verse 20, verse 9, I mean, chapter 20, verse 9 says, For as yet they did not know the scriptures uh, that he must rise again from the dead. So they were confused because he was, he was in the tomb, or he, you know, and, and they didn't know, they didn't understand, even though Jesus taught them and told them that he was going to die and on the third day he's going to be right, raised again. They still, it says they didn't understand the prophecy about the Messiah, that he was supposed to take on the sin of the world, and he was supposed to suffer. I just want to review that a little bit for you. In Isaiah 53, it says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our, of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as, as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's a prophecy of you know, a couple thousand years before, uh, this ha before Jesus shows up and this happens. And, uh, and it, if you look closely at it, it just describes his whole life. You know, he would, just a regular guy, but, but the sins of the world were placed on him. And then he was punished for us in our place, died. And then he sees the seed. He, he rises from the dead. 
This, this uh, John chapter 20 says that the disciples didn't know that. They didn't know that story. I don't understand it, Toby, but, but they didn't. And so on that morning, <clears throat> if you uh, reach chapter 20, I get down to verse 11. See, the people come and, and the tomb is empty. So it says, but Mary stood outside by the tomb. This is verse 11. Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stopped, stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw uh, two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been. Had been. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. See, she's not thinking that he rose from the dead. She's thinking they took his body. That's the first thing in her mind. They took him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Uh, she, supposing, she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where. Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me. <laughs> she sees the risen Lord. For I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I have ascended to my father and your, fa and your father and to my God and your God. So, so her, her unbelief, her fear that, that, it, that he died, her, her pain that she's feeling, you know, because he's passed away, all of that is erased when she sees him face to face. Incredible. Easter morning. <clears throat> Incredible. And, uh, let's see, I want to go to, yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If I could find it. I took it out of my Bible again. 1 Corinthians 15, 18. No, 1 through 8. 15, okay. And listen to this carefully, because it, it, first it describes the gospel, which is the good news. And then it talks about everybody seeing this risen Jesus. Uh, moreover, brethren, I declare to you uh, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received and in which you stand, by which you also you were saved, if you hold fast to the, that word which I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, or Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen uh, by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to, this, to the present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as one, one born out of, of time. And so the, the re, re, reality of the resurrection of Easter, it, it's proved because of all the witnesses that saw our risen Lord. Not just Mary, but after that, he goes to the disciples, apostles, his brother James. He goes to 500, you know, people they all saw him. And, and it's just, it's, it's true. It's true. He rose, he rose from the dead. My other, my other point, it's, it's, it's awesome so far, touch me. But, uh, but my other point is, uh, what's the point? <laughs> that he rose from the dead. Well, okay, I mean, that's awesome, but is there more? Is there, is there something? Is there a reason? Um, I'm, I'm really liking uh, the men's Bible study on uh, Wednesday night at uh, 6 o'clock in that room over there. Plenty of chairs. <laughs> you can eat dinner before or after, it doesn't matter. Anyway, I'm really liking it. And then there we're studying Romans right now. We just started. Just started, so you haven't missed much. <laughs> you can still come. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to read Romans.
Romans chapter 1, 1 through 7. I want to show you the difference between just reading the Apostles' Creed and saying, yeah, I believe that, and the difference between that and, and, and living with Christ and having a relationship with Christ, um, because I saw that uh, Wednesday night with, with, uh, with Paul. And Because listen to this. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, uh, for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended, descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. There's a clue about what's important about the resurrection. <laughs> Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of, the, of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints or set apart, uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So just for a little bit, look at the look at what this passage shows us about someone who trusts Jesus, someone who knows Christ. First of all, it says um, he's a servant, and we talked about this on Wednesday night. And if you come Wednesday night, you'll see it in other parts. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> He's a servant, and I don't know how many of us think of ourselves as, as servants of Jesus. Um, I struggle with that because I, I kind of do my own thing a lot, it feels like. Uh, especially when I read this, I go, ooh, uh-oh. Uh <laughs> but, um, but he was a servant, so he's given his life to, the, to this Jesus who rose from the dead. Uh, called to be an apostle, we looked up the word apostle, it means uh, sent one. Like, you, there's a reason you're here. You are sent. And we'll find out to who in a minute. Uh, set apart uh, for the gospel. He is uh, separated because of his faith in Jesus. He is separated from what you might call a normal life here on earth. One that most of us are living. One, one where you're going to work and you're, and you're making money so you can pay your bills. But really so that you can buy what you want mm -hmm. and uh, enjoy life. As comfortable as possible. That, that's kind of the, the normal life, but he is set apart from that for the gospel of God. And then um, it says down at the bottom, for the sake of his name among all the nations. He's set apart to spread the gospel, not just to here, but anywhere. Anywhere and anyone is his mission field. This is a picture of what, what we're supposed to be like. Servants of God who are uh, sent by God to, mess, to uh, minister the gospel, to share the gospel with people. Uh, everybody. Everybody. If you go down to uh, Romans 1.16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation. To everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And there's two more things that we learn about Paul. He's not ashamed. And we know that from reading Acts and stuff where he gets, he gets rocks thrown at him. He's almost dead. He gets thrown out of town. He gets put in prison. All this kind of stuff. He's not ashamed. He doesn't stop telling the gospel. He doesn't stop talking about Jesus to anybody and everybody. He just keeps up doing it because this is what he, this is his life, you know. Life in Christ. So he's not ashamed. But he also believes that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, taking on the sins of you and I, and, and dying, paying the price, and then rising from the dead, proving that he is who he is, and has the ability he has to take away sin, and has power over death, so that there's a potential for eternal life for people who follow him. He, he, uh, he believes that. And so wouldn't you want to share that? You know, if you really believe it, um, you want to give it to whoever you can and wherever you can. And, that, and that's, that's what he says. Now, I know I'm not going to say names because we all thought it. I'm not Paul. I'm not an apostle. Uh, you go, Paul. 
Only of my relationship with Christ, which is a little bit less, you know, not so much. Almost like a part-time Christian. <laughs> uh, but I'm not Paul. Yay, go Paul. Um, but there's some verses in here that I wrestle with when I think that, that I don't have to commit so much. I don't have to sacrifice <laughs> to, to share the gospel. Here's what it says in Philippians 2. It says, let this mind be in you. <laughs> Bummer. That's not. That's Paul talking to us, and he says, uh, "I want you to think like Jesus, who was in glory, humbled himself, came to the earth, and eventually died for us, and then rose again." But he wants us to have that mind, not just Paul. He wants us to have that. Have this mind. Let this mind be in you. In First Corinthians eleven, it says, "Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ." Oh. Bummer. <laughs> that kind of includes me too. It's not just Paul. It's not like Paul says, watch me. He doesn't say that. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. So our life is supposed to be closer to what Paul is thinking at the beginning of Romans chapter 1. And it's supposed to be one more thing. It says, uh, Matthew 16 says, take up your cross and follow me. What? <laughs> That's going a little too far. Um, Okay, and some people kind of write this, understand this more easily by saying that your cross is your handicap or your, your uh, you know, you're, you've got bad relationships in your life and those are hard and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and you're just supposed to deal with it and, and, and live and follow, follow Christ with your, with your problems. Um, maybe that's got some truth to it. But I think laying down your life is, is a lot bigger than just putting up with uh, screaming kids or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, in Romans 5, it gets even a more uh, pointed. Romans 5, chapter 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from, the, from wrath through him. For it... If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. When it says, pick up your cross and follow me, there is a tremendous amount of sacrifice involved in that. It's not just going through another day. It's intentionally sacrificing yourself for something in your life for someone else. We go, well, yeah, I raised my kids. And, but <laughs> Jesus did it while we were still sinners, not while we were his favorite people. We were enemies, and yet he sacrificed and gave his life for us. Now, I wonder, really right now there's no way to know, but how many of us would, would actually physically give up our lives for someone? It says in this passage, it, it's pretty rare. And you might do it for a righteous person, but not for a, a sinner. But how many of us are willing to sacrifice for the gospel. Because when we do that, when, when you see someone give up themselves for someone else, you're actually seeing the gospel in action. Because that's what Jesus did. He gave up for us. Now, some of you are military. I know I saw a picture of Wayne. He looked like he was 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and he's in Vietnam. <laughs> that's crazy. But when you sign up for that, you, you do sign up to lay your life down for, I don't know if you knew that back then. <laughs> That's why they let 18-year-olds go in. But, uh, 
But that's what that's one group of people who are su supposed to lay their lives down uh, potentially for for us, you know, for America. That's one group. But uh, there's a lot of other a lot of other ways to sacrifice for the gospel. Um, I wonder, and I question myself uh, when I when I found this these pa this passage, it was talking about it was me telling you stuff. <laughs> But I, I have a little harder time because I, I, I need this as much as you guys need it. So I, I wrote it down a little bit different. Am I willing to follow Jesus if it means losing my closest friends? Some of us shut up when we're around our closest friends because I don't want to lose them. And I'm afraid that if I share that they're sinners <laughs> or if I, if I, if I uh, shared Christ and, and, and the fact that it, he's my most valuable possession in my life, uh, I might lose some friends. And am I willing to sacrifice like that? To lay down that? How about, am I uh, willing to be alienated by my family? Um, most of my family has passed away, but my kids are still here. Believe it or not, I am the patriarch of my family. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, if you share Christ in the, in the family during certain things that your family's doing, there's a chance that you're going to be kind of not invited next time, things like that. Am I willing to speak for Christ even though it'll be a sacrifice of, of the relationship in my, in my family? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. How about, uh, how about uh, your, your reputation, you know? Um, I was a contractor, and contractors are supposed to be kind of gruff and mean and tough. And I like to talk about Jesus. <laughs> so my reputation, it, it was kind of cool at times because um, I, on my best crew, I had two Christians and a non-Christian. And um, even the non-Christian, when somebody came on the job site and was swearing or, or about to tell a dirty joke, they'd say, no, no, he doesn't. He doesn't know. So they would fix the crew. It's kind of that's kind of that's a reputation. That was kind of kind of good. But on the other side, yeah, they do shut up when you walk in the room, which suspicious. Not sure what they were talking about. Um, are you willing to lose your reputation? How about your job? I, I had a I had a guy in in my uh, church up in Grizzly that was he was kind of depressed and he hated his job. And he, he was a service writer at the Honda. And I said, you, 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 you make good money, you go to work and you come home, you, you hate your job. Goes, yeah, it's terrible, the people there are terrible. I go, uh, well, does anybody there know you're a Christian? He goes, uh, no, I don't wanna lose my job. <laughs> hey, are you willing to lose your job? Because if you are, he, he actually told people and his job got exciting. He did lose it, <laughs> but he got a better one. He, he now goes into auto shop undercover and finds violations and turns them in. <laughs> so, so that's exciting too. Anyway, are you afraid of losing your job, you know, because you talk about Christ? And then finally, I guess, you know, are you afraid of losing your life? And we don't, we don't really know that too, bad, too much until we get in the situation where it's we're called on to risk our life. And would we risk our life for someone like Jesus risked his life, gave his life for us? Because when we do that, I believe the world sees the gospel in flesh. And that's, that's how they can under, understand. <sighs> well, I'm done. I'm tired. Anyway. <laughs> uh, the world still needs the gospel. Uh, you know our world is so messed up. Um, but the gospel is the answer. Not, not voting in a certain person or, or not changing the, uh, certain laws or, or uh, prohibiting certain things. That's not the answer. Those, I, I would vote for that good stuff. But that's not the answer. The answer is people 